Welcome to Music Ed Tech Talk, a podcast exploring the topics of music, education, technology, and the intersections between them, with a special focus on the productive and creative process. I'm your host, Robbie Burns. Uh, well, when we said two episodes ago that you would be on more often, we weren't lying. Nope. You guys can't get rid of me. Yeah, so um, I guess, you know, rationale here is um, one of the main things I want to talk about today is uh, some recent Apple announcements. Um, you know, I think there's a, a part of the Music Ed Tech Talk audience who are music teachers looking for technology tips. And I think there's a, at least a small portion of people who are kind of connected into things that are going on in technology, like kind of as a side interest and who maybe are aware that there was an Apple event or maybe even have like researched what are some of the new features that are coming to Apple devices this fall. Um, Whatever camp you find yourself in, uh, I have so much pent up energy to talk about these things and there is no one else I would rather do it with than Craig McClellan. Yes. Yeah, I I feel the same way. I have... Avoid. I haven't really talked with anybody about this other than that you and I were texting nonstop during the keynote. Um, so I'm ready to talk about this as well. Yeah, um, I think that, um, you know, it's worth kind of just describing a little bit for those who are unaware. Um, Apple, you know, they, they make hardware, they make software, and uh, their developer conference happens around this time every year. They have a keynote where they announce not only are what are the, the features that all of their devices will have come fall, but what are the ways that third-party app developers will be able to tie into the, um, in, you know, into these devices and take advantage of them. And we, as nerds, you know, having hosted uh, a podcast together called The Class Nerd, which was all about just how can you be productive with Apple devices in your profession, um, I love to think about you know, even as early as two days after that keynote happened, I like to already be thinking about like, what are the ways I'm going to change how I work this fall? What's going to happen? You know? So yeah, there it is. Yeah. So where do we start, Robbie? I don't know. I mean, I just, you know, there's only like a couple of other minor things unrelated to the keynote I wanted to talk to you about today, but we might as well just go through the keynote first. I mean, yeah, there's uh Apple is a, a company with different hardware devices they make and each one has an operating system and, uh, the one that runs on the iPhone is iOS, and I mean, yeah, the keynote—they just sort of like went through all the new features. So, I don't know. The first, the first thing they said that they're going to do with the iPhone next year is they're going to allow you to do some stuff with the home screen. You know, the the familiar grid of apps. Finally, it's uh, it's been the same home screen for thirteen years, so it's it's time. So, in my notes, I have you know they're gonna. Eliminate that problem of having multiple pages and pages of unorganized apps by organizing them all for you into an app library, which from pictures seems to appear to be like all the way, like if you just keep swiping all the way to the rightmost screen of apps, you get kind of like a like an organized view of applications, organi- you know, like productivity and creativity and games and um and then you can choose to hide pages of your home screen. So if you've got like five pages of unorganized apps, you can hide them and just have that big drawer kind of be your dumping ground. Maybe you want like a page or two of organized, uh, you know, application icons that are already under your thumb, you know, muscle memory. But what do you think of that? Does that seem like something you'd use? A hundred percent. So right now, it, sometime in the middle of, this pandemic, I started kind of reorganizing my home screen and just kind of gave up because I got frustrated. Um, and, and I feel like this is going to solve my problem. So, so right now I'm looking at my iPhone home screen and I have two screens worth of apps. And at the top of the first screen is four folders, which I feel like would be covered by this app library. And then I've got like my most used apps uh, on the main screen, uh, music, day one, overcast, drafts. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, um, but, you know, the, really important apps to me. And then I've got a second page, which is like 
apps I'm trying out, or like I just got a new Eero set up uh, for Wi-Fi in my house, and so I've been using the Eero app a lot lately just to look at it because it's interesting to me. And so the Eero app's there, but it's probably going to be in a folder here soon. But then beyond that, it's like I've actually got empty space on my main homepage and on my second screen. And I've got these folders that I don't use because everything is searched for in Spotlight. And I feel like I'm going to be able to... And you haven't even touched on widgets on the home screen yet, uh, which is also very exciting. And I'll let you kind of explain that. But I'm going to get rid of a few apps from my main home screen and replace them with widgets. Get rid of the folders completely and let all those apps go into the app library and be done. And it's all going to be right there. And it's going to be amazing. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. I, I've got, it's my home screen is a mess right now, but the way it's usually organized is two screens of apps that are pretty much most frequently used. The first screen is like, I'm very particular about where things are. You know, I've got like Twitter cannot be in the up anywhere other than the upper left corner anymore. Like for the rest of my life, like for the rest of my life, Twitter has to be in the upper left corner. It's just going to be there. Settings is, is in the lower right hand corner. This is just the way, you know, I... It's too too many years of that. Um, and then I've got a third page of folders and stuff I'm trying out. Um, yeah, I can see this being useful. I would probably just have everything else hidden. Um, there's a couple of folders that I have because, you know, I don't know if the app library will organize the folders quite the way that I would. And I'm pretty particular about, like, I access my health apps and my home apps and my money apps folders uh, pretty frequently. And I have those organized but i don't know who like well you know widgets are a thing we should talk about that like this the idea of like all these changes to the home screen is kind of making me think like will i just kind of blow the whole thing up and maybe have some widgets on the front page and some folders on the front page and so i don't know who who knows i was just to say we should also clarify we are not running betas we are not developers that get access to those betas yet we'll we will probably put the public beta on there so this is all for us speculation we are the kind of people who think maybe an unhealthy amount about how the screen of apps is organized. <laughs> so this is, I mean, I'm feeling a little bit conflicted because the other thing that Apple is doing is they're going to let you put widgets on the home screen. Now, you can already, for those who don't know, you can already have widgets on what's called the Today View. So if you scroll one screen to the left of your main app screen, um, you get, you know, apps can kind of show you a little bit of information from within themselves. So when I, um, when I swipe to the right of my main screen, I've got like the OmniFocus widget shows me a couple of to-dos I can check off. Um, my calendar app shows me what's next. Uh, I've got some Siri shortcuts buttons that I can trigger. I've got some timers. I've been experimenting with time tracking lately so I can like run some timers right from there. Uh, a water tracking thing. So these will now be able to mix in with your app icons as like kind of like status um, board kind of style views into app content without actually having to launch them. So like you could have in the upper, what would occupy the space of the four upper left corner app icons would instead be like a weather widget that would depict a sun and tell you the degrees it is outside. Should you expect rain? So on. Yeah, so I, I feel like, you know, it's up to developers to create these widgets. But out of the ones just like from Apple, like I'm thinking the music widget, like as much as I'm in Apple Music and trying to control things, like that's interesting to me. Um, Maybe, you know, controlling Overcast or something as well from right there or Dark Noise something like that. But I don't know how many of these I'm going to do. Probably not a ton. But for sure, as soon as we get on a public beta, I'm going to at least completely blow up my home screen and try them for a little while and see how I feel. I just think the smallest of them is going to occupy the same amount of space of about four app icons. Like, do I really want to sacrifice four apps that I've created muscle memory tapping on just to s save one tap to see the weather. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, I have currently four folders that will probably go away with the app library and three empty spaces. 
So I, I've got a little bit of wiggle room on adding some some widgets. I yeah, it's gonna be interesting. I'm very excited about things that look attractive and nice, and these certainly do look attractive and nice. But in practice, I'm I'm going to we can touch base in like a month or two from now or further out. Like I have a feeling that my front page of apps is gonna just and is gonna continue to be a, a page of just apps. <laughs> yeah. But who knows? There is one there's one widget that's like a smart widget that smartly figures out what kinds of things you do on your phone during the day. And then it shows you content from within whatever app it thinks you want to see. So like when you wake up in the morning, then it's the weather. Maybe like if you launch a Siri shortcut to take you to work around 7 a.m., then it turns into the shortcut widget with some tappable things. I It sounds a lot like the way that the Siri watch face works. Uh, yeah, which is meh. Like it's... It's okay. Yeah, I want it. I want it to be my favorite thing. And did we did we do a class nerd episode on using the watch in I the classroom? We did. Yes, I'll link it to the to the notes of this episode. It's it's one of those things where it's in theory, it sounds great to always have only what you want to see in front of you. But what really what the the watch face needed. Um, the Siri watch face, what that needed was a little bit more control from third-party developers. Like I needed it to, like if you have a to-do app, that to-do app maker needs to be able to say like, hey, like listen, this person has a task due at 3 p.m. At 3 p.m., you gotta sh- you gotta show the task. Don't try to like anticipate that they open my app at this time. Like if it's, if it's 3 p.m., show them that there's a task due at 3 p.m. And it was just never that much control. And then it seems like Apple kind of forgot about it. So I feel like this could turn out the same way. Yeah. Although it is in in theory, the most appealing widget option for me. Um, so Siri and phone calls will no longer take up the entire screen when you launch them or receive them. Uh, so everybody's kind of like freaking out about this and it looks nice, but like, I guess, I guess it's cool. Like I, it, I don't know that it bothered me a whole lot before but maybe am i the only one am i crazy like yeah and i'm like very excited about this like um so if i'm driving and i tell siri to like text my wife or reroute my directions i can't see my directions anymore okay or if i am um like typing an important email and i get a phone call like that receive phone call button is right in the same spot that the keyboard is but you're still going to have to, like, swipe and ignore the call. I guess you don't have to. I guess you could just let it keep going. Yeah, but then it's like if you ignore it, it tells them. You know, it goes straight to voicemail. Oh, uh, that's true. Okay. All right. This is nice. You win. Yeah. And then, like, the Siri will show, like, rich content. So if you say, add, um, you know, remind me to um, to go to the staff lounge at 12 p.m., it'll, like, show a little mini reminders list in the lower corner of the screen without oh i missed that oh. somehow okay yeah it's nice it just gives context to things um without covering the whole screen so as a person who on my music team which is kind of like you know if you have like a like a team that you work with at a school were you what what how were you associated with a team at school were you like on the the te- like the grade yeah, level team it was that you grade level team. So I taught second grade for several years. And so I had my second grade team. There were six of us and then I moved to third grade and same. Is that, is that team in the elementary level pretty tightly connected? Like do you collaborate a lot on curriculum? Oh yeah. So do you, did you ever find yourself wishing? Well, let me I should ask this first. Did, did you ever communicate with those people in a way that was not email? Yes. So my second grade team had uh we had about 50 50 iphone and android and so we just i mean we did have group texts but sometimes you know how group texts when there's a mix of devices sometimes people's messages messages stop coming through and sometimes they'll come through hours later and it's a pain so it was terrible uh, and then when I moved to third grade, my team, we all had iPhones. So there was there was a lot of iMessaging going on. My music team uses Slack to communicate. Uh, 
and you're using that as well, right? Yeah. In my, my current job, uh, the team that I work most closely with, uh, I'll use Slack and I, I work for an ed tech company. And so it's a lot of the developers are using Slack. And then, uh, I am a customer success manager and so when there are issues with the platform or we have feedback for the developers from a customer or something like that, we get in Slack and say, hey, our platform's down, which doesn't happen very much. Um, but, you know, software, all software has issues at times. Um, and then, you know, my counterpart, the other success manager and I are slacking nonstop all day. It's mostly... Emoji and GIFs or GIFs. Ah, I can't say GIFs. I don't like it, Robbie. It's. I'm trying to be more correct. No, but it's, give up. It's GIFs. It. Uh, I, it is GIFs. It's, uh, that's. Yeah, it's what I prefer. It's GIFs. So yeah, on our music team, we we love Slack. Um, primarily, I, I feel like to to encourage a group of people to be. What do you think? Like for people who are not required to use Slack, like that would be you know the example of my music team would fit into this category. Like we choose to use it because it has a lot of utility and, and also fun. Um, how many people do you think is the minimum in order to make Slack meaningful? Like it's not, it's not really great for just two people to talk on. It's a team communication app. Yeah. I mean, what makes it nice is yes, my counterpart and I talk in there all the time, but then I can get our engineers in the same place and the, you know, it's not all that we just have one big group chat going. It's that they're all there and we keep our work conversation there. And I might text them about personal stuff in iMessage, you know, uh, but it does need to be, I, I don't know. I think five or six is probably a good number. Yeah, we have five. And even at four, it was still providing some use for us. Yeah. So some of the things I like about it are coming to iMessage this fall. Um, to be specific, you will be able to have a threaded conversation, meaning uh, if you're in a group text thread and someone says, what are we going to do about the, um, what is what is a, what is something that you would text in your third grade team? Um, you know, what, uh, what math task are we going to do this week? So then like someone else could say like, hey, um, there's muffins in the staff lounge. And then if you had missed the thread about the math task, you could like go back and reply specifically. Like you could create a sub thread underneath right. that conversation. And then you can even call out specific users. So if you have a really, really busy group thread and you don't want it to be blowing up your phone, you can set it so that only when someone specifically types your name, does it send a message to your phone. You know, obviously I'm, I'm not in the classroom anymore, but even just the amount of group threads that I'm on in general with church friends and different things, you know, um, it's going to, especially the having your name trigger it is going to be really nice. So you'll also be able to pin a conversation thread to the top. So like you could have your spouse or a good friend or a, you know, like a group thread with your staff you know, like with your third grade team could always be the topmost thing you see in messages. Yeah. And it seems like the way they're grouped, you can have multiple pinned up at the top. So you could have your significant other and your team and you could name your team conversation and give that kind of an avatar or a emoji of some sort. But this is like super nice, especially in a pandemic where like my wife and I are at home together most of the time she's actually gone back to work. Her office is really small and uh, not a lot of people in it. Um, but like, we're not texting nearly as much as we used to because we're around each other more. So then when I do need to text her, I, I it takes me forever to find that thread. And so I can pin her and a few of my colleagues up at the top and not have to worry about it anymore. I am so excited. This is my favorite of the iMessage features. Yeah, I think it's mine too. Um, I don't know how much I. Well, I don't know. iMessage is pretty is pretty pervasive. Like I do think that people eventually learned how to do emoji and stickers and things. You know, I think eventually the threading and the name uh, callouts will get 
we'll, we'll catch on. But yeah, it's, it's exactly that same use case you described. Like, it's like, why am I, why am I looking for my wife in messages? Like she should always be one tap away. Yeah. Bingo. Yep. A hundred percent. I, I have zero to say about cars. So if you want to touch on it, great. If not, then we can do app clips. It's up to you. Yeah, well, and I have zero to say about maps. I mean, you can do cycling now. I use Google Maps. Did we did we talked about this recently? Oh, you. We were talking about it during the keynote, and we. I wanted. I wondered why you used Google Maps. I, I use Apple Maps for sometimes just driving around town. Um, you know, like if I'm going to a local place, and it's easier to ask Siri to do it, and then the default Apple Maps application starts taking me there. I'm like, you know, I live, I live in between Baltimore and DC. Like, it's gonna probably be fine. But there, there are still times where even in between two major U.S. cities, where I will like in in I have been in DC before, and Apple Maps has just taken me around and around in circles trying to get to a gig. And <laughs> I'm just, I just never like it's the kind of thing where it's it's rare enough. Like Apple Maps is pretty is pretty solid, and I do actually do really think it's an easier and nicer design to follow along when you're in the car. But um, it's it's just the kind of thing, it's, it's not unlike texting your wife. Like you just, when you are going to a place, you just don't, like it, it seems like it always would fail on me in the worst moments. You know, it's like, it's when I'm driving to that gig, that's the time I don't want Apple Maps to fail once that year. You know what I'm right. saying? So Google, you know, and their search is just so much better. Plus you can, once you open Google Maps, you can program the Google Voice feature to actually overtake Siri. And then you can like have it do things that Apple Maps does not do or very well or at all. Like, um, re, you know, add spots along the way or reroute you or do a quick search. Like things I don't want to be fussing with my phone to do when I'm driving. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just, I don't have issues with Apple Maps, and I haven't since, I don't want to say the very beginning, but it's been years. So I just kind of don't even think about it anymore. One of the things that the slower teaching pace of the pandemic has been teaching me is just how much the extra transition time and flexibility with schedule is really good for my mental health. And I've just, I've got to find ways to bring that back to school when things get back to normal. Um, and you know, I, I was going to say the, the car, like the car is not really related to my profession, but it is a place that I am aware that I build stress, particularly like when I'm running to my car with my coffee and my keys in my hand, you know, before the day each morning, like it's, it's nice that my, you know, my phone software can be involved in the car and Apple announced, um, some new features that are related to the car, uh, car keys. I think this is cool. Uh, you will be able to unlock your car with your phone or your watch, and you will be able to share a key temporarily with someone over iMessage and even control how fast they drive your car. Yeah. Um, you know, potentially I, my oldest child is six. So, you know, I've, I've got 10 years before she has a car. Uh, and hopefully, you know, th in that time, you know, let's say in the next two years, this kind of becomes ubiquitous, two or three years, that would still be getting her like a seven year old car, which I feel like is, you know, probably what's going to happen. So she potentially could have this and I could control her speed. Um, so this is for me a, a much bigger long term win. I don't tend to have other people using my car a whole lot, but, um, yeah, not forgetting your keys or anything like that, just because your watch, which is always on you, that that's nice. Yeah, I think it's going to be great. Uh, car technology moves really slow, and you get, you just got to time your car purchases right. I guess that's the frustrating thing is it's like if you're a year off. Like I, I had um, an aftermarket unit in my old car that gave me CarPlay, but uh, I bought my current replacement for that, which is a 2016 Honda Odyssey the year before the Honda Odyssey got CarPlay. And I thought, I actually would not have bought it knowing that, except for that, I thought I would be able to install my aftermarket thing. And I, I actually need to reinvestigate this because there, there might be a workaround now, but I pretty early on after buying the car, took it to the Best Buy 
what's the the geek is it the geek squad yeah, yeah the, the people who do the car installations um and they said that uh there was currently no kit for the the model of my odyssey because it has those turn lane cameras in it and they would have to cut the wire to the video feed from that camera in order to install an aftermarket and i was like you know what no thank you yeah so my uh 2013 toyota forerunner which i got last year um i also very quickly started researching uh carplay aftermarket things for it and uh it 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 you'd have to like replace the entire the entire dashboard almost it was like a multi thousand dollar replacement and i was like no i'm good i'll just have to wait until this car dies and i'm sad but it's not just like a 3 to 500 dollar thing it was like a thousand fifteen hundred dollars and i was like i can't i can't justify that yeah i mean if anyone really wants their iphone to be with them in a more intimate way in the car. Uh, there's a company called ProClip that will match to your exact make, model, and year of car a piece. It's kind of like a two-step product. You buy the, the piece that matches your car exactly, and then you have a ton of options of phone clips that then attach to the attachment. And it's very customizable. I have used like four of them, four different ones over the course of the life of my various cars and upgrading different phones with different connectors and things and you know it's a smaller screen and uh you know it's fine i like it's you know i have the big iphone so i never struggle to read maps it's in a very ideal spot like right next to the dashboard like you can see traffic in front of you when you're looking at it nice so i do miss carplay though and it's actually carplay is like way nicer now than it was when i had it so yeah ooh. back back when we could travel um, I, I had a couple rental cars when I was doing work trips that had CarPlay and I like, when I got in the car and saw that it was CarPlay, it made my day. Yeah. And it like does stuff now, like you can use Google maps in CarPlay now. Yeah. If you don't know, if you're listening, you don't know what CarPlay is. It, you plug in your phone to your car and <sighs> it, you know, you get a grid of iOS apps on the dashboard of your car. It looks like there's an iPhone running on the dashboard of your car and you, you know, it limits kind of some categories of apps like messages and um, phone and music and podcasts and maps, you know, things, things that are allow you, you know, things that support the experience of driving and don't distract you. Like there's no email app <laughs> in CarPlay. Yeah. Um, all right. So then the next feature is app clips. And these are like little bits of apps that, can run on your phone in certain circumstances without being installed on your phone. Yeah. So um, I, I'm trying to remember when it was, but sometime probably right before the pandemic, my wife had to, um, I think it was when we were like dealing with uh, adopting our kids and she had to like go to a, a court thing, something where she had to go to a parking garage and had children with her. And she gets to the parking place and she's got to download an app in a parking garage with very little service. She had to create an account with that app, put in her credit card information into this app in her phone, all while managing children and stuff, and then put in the parking spot and all this stuff just to be able to park. And she was like almost in tears by the end of it. Cause the kids were being crazy. There are cars everywhere. She's trying to deal with keeping them safe. It was like awful. Um, and now you could just scan a little QR code and 10 megabytes or less of that app would download. You can use Apple pay. You can use sign in with Apple to create the account, pay for your parking spot. And then it's just kind of gone and you're done or at least it kind of retains that in memory for a little while. So if she needed to refill the parking or something, she could, but like it, like that scenario would not have happened if we had had app clips at the time. And so like things like that, I think are going to be so helpful. And I, I'm trying to, I've been trying to think about like education purposes and things like that. And I, you know, I don't have a good one, but just from a like personal quality of life, perspective like this is awesome yeah 
so there's there, i don't know it's it's interesting there's there's pl- tons of small little ways i can see it being used i actually have um i'm a little bit pessimistic about this getting really widely adopted soon i think it's the kind of thing where a lot of companies will just ignore its existence like like the kinds of like there will be a couple of those you know as there always are people who are like oh we've got like apple pay right from day one you know those apps that always support all the cool features but it's not going to be the actual one parking garage that you need in that exact situation (laughs) right at least for years it's the kind of thing where i think you know like like paying with a phone to get your groceries i think you know give it years and years and years then you'll really start to see it be more standard but i yeah i I don't know i'm a little pessimistic about being able to use that in the immediate future yeah um so you know um our our darling the ipad um got some updates also yeah but not as many as i'm a little disappointed I think that what we got is excellent and we've got the the trackpad support that just came out in March and so they they've been continually giving us iPad stuff but for this to be year 2 of iPad OS like giving it its own name and like it's it's its own thing and we're really going to full speed ahead development on it I was like eh. I feel like if the keyboard and trackpad had had and then that you know the cursor support built into the software had been announced though you would feel oh a hundred percent a hundred percent because i've been using the cursor support on the ipad and really enjoying it for the past couple of months and I, you know it's, it's nice that they got that out the door when they did um i do agree that it's like you know the ipad i, I feel like the frustration with not a lot of stuff happening to ipad is just built off of years and years and years of not a lot of stuff happening to ipad and you know i mean one of these years they're gonna hopefully Make, I mean, I think one of the big things that people really want to see the iPad do is have more control over audio ins and outs. This is certainly, as a music teacher, really relevant to me. Um, oh, and as a podcaster, like I, I, you know, I cannot easily record with you because right now I am talking to you in a microphone that is the input of both FaceTime and Logic Pro, where I'm recording, and that's just not a thing well, on the iPad. And just in. Uh, uh, covid world like you know the, i spend all day on zoom with customers and and i do it on my mac because i can't be sharing my screen on zoom and taking notes on the call on the same screen uh, the ipad because the customer would see what i'm writing down and so but i've got multiple screens on my mac to be able to do that and so like in video call land, it's really hard when those video calls take up the whole screen. And a lot of times if you bring another app in, even it kind of cuts off your camera and stuff. So th- there, there are some things that they could have done along that audio and video route that would have potentially even brought me back to using my iPad as my main device more. I do agree. Yeah. As, as someone who's been using Google meet to teach public school, you know, middle school music classes, um, I've, I've been actually using Chrome on my Mac because not only do I need to be able to share my screen and, um, you know, have, be able to run multiple apps at once and not have my students see them all. Um, but yeah, I need to be able to do exactly what you're saying is like have other, not have those other apps, you know, disrupt me from being seen or seeing my students. Like when you close that zoom call, um, I'm pretty sure that the other side of the party can't see you anymore. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's that's frustrating. And then even on, uh, you know, on the Mac side of things, there are things that specifically the Mac version of Chrome can do that you could not dream of doing on iPad OS. Things like, I mean, extensions, which we'll get to in a little bit, but also um, you can choose specifically what content is seen by the other party. So I can say, hey, just show this window or this Chrome tab of Chrome rather than my entire screen. And, and that's for the current kind of times we're living in. That's a really useful utility. Yeah. So And that, go ahead. Uh, I, I was going to transition to features that I am excited about, but. No, no, well, we, we should definitely do that. I was going to say, though, you know, it's one of these things uh, just because we're always kind of talking about, you know, is the iPad a tool that we can use for all of our work? I mean, most certainly in the current time that we're living in um, between 
the the Google Meet situation I just described and editing lots of virtual band videos in Logic and Final Cut Pro, definitely the Mac has been the the tool of my life for the past couple of months. Yeah. Yeah, and I you know, I'd be curious if I were still in the classroom, would I still be running everything from my iPad? Uh, you know, and I don't know how much I would have been zooming or doing, you know, I, I, I don't have a way of saying that, but I think it's more likely that even, even if I was still teaching, I would be looking for something else because doing a lot of that virtual stuff is hard. Yeah, it's tough. So what are some features about iPad OS that you were excited about? So the main thing, uh, you know, there, there are some things that make the iPad more Mac, like, you know, some sidebars on apps and just making use of the, the bigger screen as opposed to an iPhone. But the big thing is the Apple pencil stuff. So Apple has introduced something called scribble. And if there is a, it looks like from what I'm seeing from developers and stuff that if you can input text into your app, then it just automatically, if you have the Apple Pencil in your hand, you can hand write into that text field and it'll convert it to text for you, um, which is crazy good. Um, I, mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm hoping, you know, on the Apple Watch, there's the uh, the little scribble thing if you if you want to write a message. And it even just with my terrible handwriting with my index finger on the Apple Watch, it gets it right. So I feel like, you know, with a pencil on an iPad, it would do a, a good job. So, and we may speak about this later, but I, I have definitely been handwriting a lot more lately. And so like this, this is exciting for me. You know, and a lot of these, like these sidebar additions to iPad OS, and then some of the Mac stuff that we're going to get to in a minute, definitely does seem like their different operating systems are borrowing a lot of the same design language from one another. But in Apple's persistence that these are two separate platforms, they have continued to really double down on Apple Pencil as a really useful input tool on the iPad. And I love it. I mean, the app, the Apple Pencil is such a big part of my creative process on the iPad, especially now that I'm using StaffPad to compose music with the Apple Pencil. And it, you know, it automatically converts to beautiful and professional music notation. Um, you know, I edit this podcast in an app called Ferrite where it's a lot easier to be really precise with where I make cuts to the waveform with the Apple Pencil. Not to mention, like, if you're just lounging back on the couch and holding the iPad in your hand, like, I don't know, this this just sounds trivial, but it's like, okay, I've got, it's the end of the day. I don't want, you know, I've spent all day yesterday editing a video of my woodwind quintet in Final Cut, and Mary and I are watching Avatar The Last Airbender on the couch, and I'm sitting in a posture that if I wanted to answer a quick text message from my iPad, like, I would be balancing it on one leg, and it would be really fumbling around, and I thought this sounds, like, so ridiculous, but, like, if I could just, with the pencil, write a quick response to a text message, right, in the message, you know, in the text field of messages, like, that's gonna make the iPad a more flexible tool to a lot of people. Yeah. I I love it. And then things like, and I don't even completely understand it, but you know how, like if you have a specific time written out or an address or something, if you, if iOS sees an address in an email, it knows that that's an address and you can tap on it and it'll pull it up in maps. It can do that. Like with your handwriting, if I were to write one, two, three main street, Nashville, Tennessee, it would, I could somehow tap on that. Or if I'm in handwriting apps or notes or something where I'm actually just handwriting my notes, it can like, you can select that handwriting. It knows that that's text and you can select and copy and paste it as text and do like, it's crazy good. And uh, it is kind of pulling me back to like, how could I incorporate this into my work life, into my, you know, other things, because it's just, I think going to be a game changer. I, at some point wanted to try to sneak in your text message to me earlier to the, or last night yeah. <laughs> about buying, buying a bullet journal. You know, it's, it's funny. Like I, I fully live in an app called OmniFocus for doing tasks. And I, obviously it's, you know, it's a, it's computer software. So you type your to do's into it, but you know, there's something really friendly about handwriting 
Um, particularly when you are managing to dos for the day or large scale projects, or just as being the simplest way to get a thought down. Like if you, if the iPad is off and you tap the Apple pencil to the darkened screen, it'll open up a quick note and you can just start handwriting into an Apple note. Like I love that for text input, but I almost never use it because I know that I'm going to just copy it into OmniFocus later. But now I could like just select my handwritten text and then hit the copy button and then paste it right in. Or potentially like write a task, just write it in OmniFocus and have it convert to printed text for you right on the task input page. Exactly. But I'm, I'm even thinking like one of the things OmniFocus will do is it works with a syntax called task paper, mm-hmm. which is to say if you like type in, if you write like, um, you know, like I, I take my band to uh, an assessment once a year where they perform for some judges. And if I, you know, if I write assessment and then a colon and then a dash on the next line and then a task and then a dash on the next line and another task, OmniFocus interprets that as a project with subtasks. And I could potentially just, write that in Apple Notes with the Apple Pencil in a way that is far more cognitively sane (laughs) for my brain. There's less overhead mentally doing it that way. Um, But I could feasibly then just like copy and paste it later into the app and add due dates and deadlines and all that fun stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be curious. Now, I have not gone full fountain pen addict crazy person, but I, I... I have been looking at some ways to kind of bring a little more peace to my life in the middle of pandemic stress and working from home at a job I never intended to work from home at with three small kids here. And, you know, there's a lot happening. And I have found I bought a in the in the scheme of things, cheap fountain pen. You know, a lot of times I I bought one that was like 30 bucks, not, you know, 100, 200, 800, multiple thousand dollar pens, 30 bucks. And have gotten like a nice notebook and have been just kind of like taking notes on on calls and stuff with that and journaling and then scanning that into day one. So I have it in my digital journal, but like I, I it's my written thoughts where I've slowed down and stuff. So, uh, you know, I, there is there really is when people say there's something to like putting physical pen to paper that you don't get with the Apple Pencil and glass. But for a lot of people, and for me even, like, I find that I retain the information better. But maybe being able to to take things that way could be really beneficial. So I don't, I don't know. The bullet journal thing that I texted you about is totally a, I'm going to try this. And it comes tomorrow and I'm going to set it up for July and, you know, we'll figure it out. But, like, I am much more a proponent of writing things down. And so anything to convert that to digital in a better way, I'm all for. Yeah, that's that's one of the reasons I've always liked tools like MindNode, things that are yeah, it's like a computer software application, but you kind of you can like drag things around in a friendly way, but then you get that added benefit of like I, I'm explaining this poorly. If some if no one's ever used MindNode, you you it's like a mind map. You have like a central bubble, and then you add these like little lines off the center that you type stuff into, and then you add lines off of those centers. They call these they call these nodes. And then you, you know, you, you make this big giant brain that is very visually appealing and easy to use because you can just take your finger and drag the nodes where you want them to be. But then you get this added benefit of because it's a computer program. Well, when I drag a node where there's other nodes, they all like smartly get out of the way and organize themselves to where there's balance and there's, you know, proper use of white space. Um, you know, I like I like those kinds of tools and, you know, writing. I mean, this this is sort of related to the writing sheet music thing, because, you know, the the app I've been using for writing sheet music is certainly not perfect on the handwritten note input. But there is just something very, very pleasing about writing directly with a pencil on a surface. And I think it re- it's why the Apple Pencil resonates with people who are not just artists. Any other any, anything else on iPadOS that you wanted to? I mean, there are a few other small things, but I'm I'm kind of good to to move on to the watch if you are. Yeah, well, don't forget AirPods. Oh yeah, that's right. There were some some updates at AirPods. Now, Robbie, do you do you have AirPods Pro or are you still on regular AirPods? Yeah, I have the AirPods Pro. I have feelings. 
<laughs> okay. They don't fit my. They just they're great. They they're one. They're all of the amazing things you might read about them are true. They just don't fit my ears as well as the older model. Yeah. I never worry about the original AirPods falling out of my ear, um, but the AirPods Pro don't really form the same seal, particularly my left ear. And, you know, I've tried different tips. I actually, uh, there's been a, a brand of foam tips made by a company called Compli that has been getting passed around the internet a little bit. And I actually just ordered some. They shipped today and they, I'm having mixed success getting them to snap onto the AirPods, but so far they seem to stick a lot better. And they, they really bump, um, they really keep out, it seems like they keep out more sound, which it, you would expect from foam tips. But what's funny is that the Apple, um, the settings app, when you do that test to see if they're filling your ears, they f- every single size of them completely fails the ear fit test. Hmm. But the sound of them is identical, if not better, to when I'm getting a good seal on the standard tips. So yeah, the AirPods Pro, is it, I forget where you pluralize it is it airpods pro or yeah yeah, AirPods yeah, yeah. pro um surely they sure <laughs> they're they're really nice they're just nice they're just nice typical apple niceness um would i wear them on a plane sure they're good enough to wear on a plane i think i would if i had a nice overhead set i would still prefer that but and um the thing i like most is that the you play and pause and, and initiate siri by just squeezing the tip and it is like a little clicky sound that you get in your ear. I'm not sure if there's haptic feedback or you just, the sound makes you feel a vibration. So it feels like you're actually pressing a button. They're nice. They're very nice. Yeah, I, you know, I, I ordered the original AirPods on day one that you could order them. And then when AirPods 2 came out, I ordered those and got the Qi charging case and then, you know, only like six months later did the pros come out, but I had just spent like $200 six months before that. And so I just couldn't justify it. I know that when these eventually die and, you know, it, by the time I got to AirPods 2, my ones were just the, the battery was toast. Um, you know, it's a, such a small battery and I got about two good years of using literally every day. Um, so I got my money out of them. I'm going to get my money out of these. I will go pro next time, but I couldn't justify six months later. Um, yeah, I'm glad I kept my old model because of just that, you know, I, I'm not like, I'm not worried I'm going to lose them, but when I run, I take the old pair. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a little bit more peace of mind. Um, yeah. And that totally makes sense. Um, they're, they're not worth, I don't think they're worth it. The main, you know, what's more important to me just because I'm such a, such a software nut. I mean, that's, why we're spending this whole episode talking about software is um, the update to getting the always on Siri listening was, is more important to me than any of the hardware features that the pro model adds. Oh, I use that all the time. And I'm not going to say, say the phrase cause I've got too many devices nearby, but like I use that to, I, I have a, a shortcut and we talked a lot about shortcuts last time I was on your show. And we talked about it a lot on the class nerd. Um, but I have a shortcut set up to skip to the next chapter in overcast, which is the podcast player I use. And so a lot of the shows that I listen to have chapters and the ads are a second chapter. And I'm not, I always find out what the ad is. And if it's something that I've never heard of before, I'll try and listen. But you know, after the 10 billionth square space ad, yeah, I'm good. And so I just say, uh, Hey lady, next chapter. And my AirPods just know, and they do it. And it's like, I'm just walking through my neighborhood and I tell the lady to do something and she does it. And my AirPods, or I can tell her to text my wife and I don't have to look at my watch. I don't have to look at my phone. It is magic having the AirPods be able to hear you when you call her name. When you've programmed your phone to do anything it possibly can with Siri shortcuts as we both have. It's, it's amazing to just have that always listening. You know, it's just like, it's, it's one of the things that makes me wish that like, cause one of the things I struggle with AirPods is that they're not that professionally appropriate in a music classroom. Like, first of all, I'm always on my feet 
and a student could walk into my office at any time and need my undivided attention. So it's just, you know, it's not that natural to have them in for simply the utility of telling my phone to do stuff. Um, not to mention that, you know, I'm oftentimes listening to music and I need to have like both of my ears freed up. You know, I, if it were a little bit more socially acceptable and less clumsy to transition them in and out of my ears, I would, I would wear one in my right ear all all day long, every day, just to be able to like add reminders to my to-do list and run Siri shortcuts, you know, they'll all just to, to run all of the things that I can't because I have, I have all of that programmed, but I just find that it's not, entirely appropriate to have them in when I'm in the workplace but in my home during the pandemic I can wear them in my ears all the time and I love them like things that are such a drag for me like doing the dishes I hate doing the dishes I never want to do the dishes but I use the noise canceling to tune out the sound of the running water and I just you know I've this is now that there's no commute. This is how I catch up on my podcasts. And I've actually explored some new podcasts because I've run out of podcasts to listen to doing mundane things like doing the dishes, taking out the trash, cleaning the house. Oh, yeah. That's the I, I my AirPods and I use it for calls. Uh, you know, I, I use it with Zoom again all day, every day, um, just because there's always there are always children outside my room making noise that I don't want a microphone to pick up. So I just do the call with my AirPod and, you know, it's not the most professional looking thing, but also, you know, other people get on a call with a giant headset and a microphone. And I'm like, I don't know that I look any goofier than you do. Yeah, the AirPods are they're they're useful. And, you you know, you'd think that they're not great for that sort of thing. But I have I have students who for my band assignments I saw in uh, my videos so many kids with AirPods recording along to my play along track. Oh, and, oh uh, they have been the absolute winner. AirPods and Zoom have been the winners of the pandemic. Like every video that you see where somebody is on a Zoom call with Jimmy Fallon or recording music with their bandmates from different houses, AirPods. Yep. Joel, Without a doubt. Joel McHale interviewing the cast of Tiger King. AirPods. Yeah, they're wonderful. Sorry. And, <laughs> that, <laughs> that was that was a soapbox. Did, no, it's great. Well, we haven't even talked about what they'll do this fall. So they're going to get some new features. I'm um, nervous about them. To, you can you can explain them. I'm nervous. Well, we'll see if they work. I mean, it's like it's like any new Apple thing. Like if it works, it's going to be great. If it doesn't, it will be disappointing. Um Apple has been pretty consistent with AirPods. Like they've been pretty consistently good. I run into some weird bugs when I'm switching devices, which is, um, I think what part of your apprehension is, is that the first feature they're adding is that it will more smartly switch between them. So for example, if I am on my phone talking to someone and then I want to listen to a podcast on my iPad, I can Honestly, it's it's quite easy to do. I can just go to my iPad and then go into the settings or use the control center feature to switch the output to my AirPods. But what apparently the new feature is going to do is it's going to more smartly figure that stuff out. So if I'm on a phone call on my iPhone and then I hang up and then I start listening to a podcast on my iPad, the AirPods are apparently going to think, okay, well, you're doing audio output on this other device that's connected to your iCloud account, so we're going to connect to your iPad now. Or you are just sitting down uh, to watch Avatar The Last Airbender on your Apple TV, we're going to switch to your Apple TV so that you never really have to think about fussing with those little buttons and knobs. You're just always getting the audio stream of whatever Apple thing you're using without tapping anything. And and yeah, and my concern is just like, I just feel like there's so much room for it it to go wrong. Like I am listening to a podcast while sitting in a room while my kids are watching TV. And I just really don't want to watch my little pony, but I'm snuggling with them or something, but like they turn on my little pony and I've got the podcast going. Is it going to switch to the Apple TV? without me wanting it to, or, you know, how is it going to know for sure what my intent is if I have multiple devices going? I guess you would have them then because Apple TV will set up multiple user accounts. I guess you would have to have a kid's account and then maybe it would 
know the difference? I we let's not even get into multiple user accounts on Apple TV because it's it's a mess. It's, I know. it's a hot mess, and we're not going to set it up anytime soon at our house. Yeah, there's only two users on our Apple TV, and they're both me. <laughs> there's Robert Burns parentheses one and Robert Burns parentheses two, which is like bringing really bring, bringing me back <laughs> to Apple problems I had like five or six years ago. Um, Ro- I'm not Robert Burns in either of my iCloud accounts, but all of my most recently watched TV shows sync correctly across devices. So who, who even knows what's happening? It's a mess. Anyway, <laughs> um, AirPods will also be able to do spatial audio processing, which means that if you're watching a TV show, they will make things sound like they're coming from different places of the room. And because there are accelerometers and other fun things inside of AirPods, if you like turn your head to the left, it'll apparently adjust dynamically so that it sounds like different things that are coming from the music or the TV show or the podcast will continue to sound like they are stationary in the room, despite you moving your head. So like if someone in a show is, you know, in a surround sound system, sounds like they're coming from behind me to the right. Well, if I am wearing AirPods and I turn my head to the left, you know, the AirPods are doing their best job to imitate that feeling. But that person who's behind me to the right is still going to sound like they're behind me to the right. Whereas with the spatial audio thing, if I turn my head to the left, well, now they might sound like they're to my left because my head has moved. Um, so that's that's cool. <laughs> I, I welcome that. And see, I, I don't know if you mentioned this, but I think that's only for the pros. And so I'm I'm a, I'm that is a bummer that I'm not going to get that. We'll see. It sounds like a nice thing. It's certainly not the thing I'm most excited about, but it sounds like it'll be much appreciated. All right, Watch OS new Apple Watch features. Um, dance. You've been uh, you've been logging a lot of activity in your Apple Watch by dancing with your kids. I've noticed. Uh, yeah, <laughs> um, teachers. We'll, we'll know, should be familiar with Go Noodle. Uh, I, especially during the spring, uh, the beginning of the pandemic, when it was raining all the time and we couldn't go outside, uh, we did a lot, a lot of Go Noodle in our house. And uh, I decided, I turned on, I don't remember what um, activity type I chose. I'm, I'm trying to look now. Oh, there is a dance, but I think it's supposed to be even in Watch OS six. But I think it's now supposed to be like more accurate or something. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I don't know if I want it to be more accurate because I'm not doing super in- intense dancing, and I still want to close my rings. But you know, we'll see. <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure in our episode of the Class Nerd on mental health, we did. Uh, we talked about how. Not every data, not every workout type that the Apple Watch is capable of processing is actually exposed to the Apple Workouts app. So like I have a climbing app that when we were going through our rock climbing phase last year, um, like when I run that app, it'll show up in the Apple Activity app as a climbing workout. It's even got a little green dude climbing a mountain, but uh, the Apple Workouts app will not give me that option. Uh Either this changed with watchOS 6 or we were just dumb. But now if you scroll all the way to the bottom, excuse me, if you scroll all the way to the bottom in the workout app, um, there's add workout and you can see every workout type. So um, that that is different from how I remember it. So yeah, there will be more. Uh, more workouts there, I guess. Nice. Um, sleep is another health related thing that, you know, speaking of things that hold or, you know, holistic and important. Um, this is certainly one of them. Uh, I've been sleep tracking with some third party apps, but it'll be nice to see Apple do this in their own unique way. And I just really hope that it's more accurate because it's got permissions and things that, third party apps are never going to have because like there was a night the other day I, I, I did not sleep well a few nights last week. There was one night that I woke up at 1230 and was awake until about 4 AM. And it's still, I woke up the next morning and auto sleep was like 
you got nine hours of sleep. And I was like, "How? no, that did not happen in any way, shape, or form. So I, I, I hope that it's better. I hope so, too. And it's going to do neat stuff like... It'll it'll be talking to your phone a little bit. So they, they discuss in the keynote how there's this whole wind down feature of the phone where the phone will offer you to go in, into do not disturb mode around the time that you have set your bedtime goal. And it'll even put on the screen some Siri shortcuts, some options from other apps. Like, do you want to run a headspace meditation to get ready for bed? Or do you want to run a scene in your home that turns off the lights? Or do you want to run a bedtime shortcut, which was a huge subject last time you were on this show. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm um, excited about that. So I would love, yeah, I'd love a wind down mode, you know, my phone to go dim and discourage me from using apps, a one tap button to run my bedtime shortcut. And, uh, and then I guess what the watch does is, is, uh, it'll automatically go into mo- something that's similar to movie theater mode where the screen has to be tapped to turn on and I appreciate that because that's even though my series shortcut that we talked about last time uh, has a lot of that phone stuff already pre-programmed I still have to manually fiddle around with a lot of watch settings so that it doesn't wake up like I will actually feel Mary sometimes in the middle of the night like <laughs> grabbing my left arm and like noodling around in the control center on my Apple watch to try to get the light <laughs> to stop turning on so that's it. now I am hoping that the sleep tracking features all completely work on a series three Apple watch, because when I upgraded the series five, I just kept my three to use as my nighttime watch and I use it just for sleep tracking and that's it. And it's always in movie theater mode. So I don't have to worry about that. As soon as I put that watch on, it's, it's time for bed, Um, which is great. I, I just hope that it has enough sensors or whatever that it can, do the sleep tracking to the full extent that the five can. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I actually, to this day, will still sometimes use my Series Zero Apple Watch as a sleep tracking device. That's impressive. It's fine. It does the job. Yeah. But, you know, with the being at home all the time, it's not, I haven't been doing that because it's easy to throw the Apple Watch on to the charger. I usually, you know, I charge the watch now when I work out because my exercise bike has a Bluetooth heart rate monitor that does what the Apple watch would do. And then the app of that bike then like syncs the data back to my phone and then watch. So it still fills the rings. Right. Kind of cool. That's nice. Um, yeah. So sleep is important. Uh, serious shortcuts are going to be on the watch. Yes. Um, I'm excited about this. I don't, I don't, I haven't thought through like what shortcuts would I really want to have there? And, you know, but just the fact that they're there and they were, you know, we've, we've talked about this before, but, uh, shortcuts used to be an app called workflow that Apple purchased and then transitioned into shortcuts and workflow had a watch app. And then when it became shortcuts, the watch app went away. So it's been a weird omission. I'm glad it's back. Now I, I saw this, I think I messaged you this earlier today. This is equally if not more exciting to me is that a an iPhone Siri shortcut can now include changing watch faces and settings as actions. So, oh, and <laughs> we were talking about how like some of our shortcuts require the confirmation last time yes. we were speaking. Well, there you can now have something happened at a certain time of day. So like you could just basically say, you know, at 11 o'clock run my good night scene. I don't even have to press anything or to reference last episode. You know, I was talking with my colleague about how FileMaker now has series shortcuts. You could, for those who listen to that episode, you know, we could potentially run our email script that sends all of our students, parents, a progress report on every student who played for us that day, that could just be a series shortcut that runs in the background on my phone. Yeah. Or you could potentially touch a button on your watch and make that happen too. Right. It's kind of ridiculous to think that I could make a FileMaker script run from my watch. That's very powerful. Yeah. And nerdy. Yeah. Pretty cool. Very, very nerdy, very nerdy. Well, and I, I just love the idea of like, when I get home, I 
you know, of course, when I actually am driving to work. But, you know, I have very different things I like to do at work. You know, classes end at very obscure times and Elegant Mills Middle School doesn't have bells. You know, the, the policy is that teachers just respect each other's time and you let your kids out on time. And it's really hard to remember to let a, a class of band students out at 9.57. And, you know, they have to, like unpack their instruments and pack them up in a really space confined situation. So I have to let them out at least three minutes early. And, you know, I don't want to mess that up. So I will usually use a digital style watch face during the day, which is just a little easier to read more precisely. And, uh, but when I get home, I like to use that watch face that has like nine different buttons on it (laughs) because I like to be able to add my water real quick, see my activity, run timers for the kitchen and see the weather all that stuff. So it'd be cool to program a series shortcut that, you know, at 4 p.m. every day just automatically changed the buttons that appear on my watch. Yeah, man, I hadn't even thought thought that through. That's amazing. Yeah. Hey, you just closed all three of your rings. Way to go, buddy. Ho, <laughs> oh, I did. It's nice. Good timing. Wow. Oh, yeah, there we go. Lovely. See, now that's a thing. Is What we need next is for the complications on the Apple Watch to be able to, like, I love that I could manually program them, but I'm hoping that in a future watch update, they get a little smarter. Like, I don't want to see that one as soon as I finish filling my rings. Yeah. Now, uh, there are some some improvements to complications in watchOS 7. Um, my favorite is y- you can have, right now, if on a watch face, I want two complications from the same app. So let's say carrot weather. Um, I want to have one complication that shows me the current temperature and one that shows me current precipitation chances. I cannot do that if they are the same shape or size of complication on the same watch face. Um, Or even on different watch faces. I think it's like, all of a certain shape complication have to be the same across your device. Uh, and and where this comes in most handy, there's an app uh, called Watchsmith um, from uh, David Smith is a developer and you can create your own complications. But even still with that, you can only have like just a few complications from his app that you created because you were limited to how by how many complications you could have from one app so this makes things a lot more customizable i understand what you're saying now so see i didn't even think you could do two different complications from the same app even if they were different shapes but i guess you can do that now yes so if i had a circular shape complication that showed me is it going to rain from the carrot weather app and then i had like a corner shaped one that says, what's the temperature? I technically could have them both showing up at the same time. Correct. So what this means is that a developer could also kind of design their own watch face by basically, like the example they use in the keynote is if you're a surfing app and you've got like, you know, are there lots of sharks in the area is a type of complication that can show up on your watch face or what's the weather going to be like in a particular area or how are the waves? Well, now you can create your own watch face out of one of Apple's pre-existing styles and you can pre-install the different complications in a particular order. So like maybe it's the modular watch face and the big fat complication in the middle shows you what the waves are going to be like that day. And then the circular shaped one in the lower left corner tells you the temperature that it's going to be. And you as a developer can share this watch face i think in the apple watch app or store there are a bunch of different ways you can share watch faces now including just text message or twitter or something to to your friends right so i think it would be fun to make like a band director watch face you know something that's like loaded up with a tuner and a metronome i was literally i was sitting here thinking like what would robbie like be his what would be his band director watch face oh yeah i would have the tonal energy app one tap away it would probably have um, timers and alarms, you know, to make sure that you, as I was saying, you know, you want to end your class on time. Uh, so probably some timers and alarms. Uh, yeah, the, no, the calendar event with the start and the end date. You know, you, there's there's tons of potential. Yeah. You, you better believe I'm going to make one. And, you know, how, however specific to the field it is, I'm going to call it 
the band directors watch face and share it probably on Twitter or my blog. It's got to happen. Oh, a hundred percent. So, um, you know, home kit and TVs OS will be able to do new stuff, but, um, I feel like we can skip through some of that because there were some very major announcements for the Mac. If, if you had told me right before the keynote that I would walk away most excited about the Mac announcements out of all the different platforms, I would have been shocked. And yet here we are. Um, I mean, we're, we're going to get into all of it, but even aside from the big uh, Apple chip transition thing that, w- that we'll talk about here, even just the new operating system, Mac OS Big Sur, which when I was telling the name to my wife, she thought that it was Big Sur S-I-R and was like, <laughs> <laughs> she, she did not understand at all. It's S-U-R. Uh, as in the place in California and I believe in Spanish that's South. Um, but, uh, I could be wrong there. Someone can call me out. I'm okay with it. Um, but like even just that Mac OS update, I'm so excited about it. And yeah, I'll, I'll let you kind of go through what some of the updates are, but I, I just I've been dying to talk to you about this. Yeah, I'm actually totally thrilled. Um, Big Sur is actually a place I have been. Very beautiful. I, I'm jealous. Uh, my wife and I had hoped to go to California in October for our 10 year anniversary. We are not planning to do that anymore. But um, I, I'm super jealous. I want to go to California. I'll send you some pictures. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I I think the thing that there's there's two things about the Mac that surprised me the most. I mean, it's getting a lot of changes to design. Um, you know, all, all of the sidebars are going to get super translucent and lots of translucency. Lots of um, toolbar icons and buttons and things are going to look a lot less button like and look more like kind of that. I don't know the technical term for it, but you know, on, on iOS, buttons aren't really buttons. They're just sort of like outlines of shapes and um you know there's going to be a whole lot of that borrowed in the same way that you know some of those sidebars are going to come from the mac to the ipad a lot of those style choices and the design of ios are coming to the mac which i think i think that's nice um i'm a little upset that it looks like they're going to change all of the icons to a shape that's more or less the same shape that iphone and ipad apps take um you know, I think it's fun that Mac apps have varying different shapes, but, you know, whatever, I'll get used to it. It's going to really bum me out when all my music apps don't conform to that shape. Right. Um, oh, it's going to be years before they start conforming. Yeah, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be uh, super frustrating. But, you know, I think it looks, it looks really nice. I'm a little worried that it will not be as easy to read stuff on. Like I saw a tweet today of, like, here's what, this, here's what the settings screen in the mail app looks like on the current version and on Big Sur. And it's just like, there's just a lot less visual interest to draw your eyes to where you go. Like aside from me liking that kind of 3D and that kind of color, uh, you know, behind the icons and and everything, you know, I I think it's also easier to locate stuff when it pops a little bit. So I don't know. It'll be, it'll be interesting. Time will tell. And it's really, you know, we went... With with Mac OS, we went with the old style kind of U, UI, the pre iOS seven, very flat. You know, the, it was a lot more in your face and round and skeuomorphic and things up until uh, ten point ten, which was Yosemite, and it got very flat. And then since then, it's kind of, they've kind of pulled back from that. And this feels like no, no, no. Now we're going back to that again, but also with some shadow and stuff it's it's really it it feels like a regression in a good way to some extent but it's it's weird to me it's weird to me too it's definitely attractive um you know in that appeal of like having a new shiny thing will probably make make me excited to use it uh despite any flaws but you know i i think it's good i think that it's 
most interesting to speculate like what are some of the reasons why they could be going quite this extreme in this direction like it makes so much sense that the mac and ios devices share a similar kind of design style but there's just like it's it's real heavy-handed in some places and i've seen a lot of people speculate that it looks like a lot of the touch areas (laughs) i said touch areas uh it looks like a lot of things are spaced out and maybe a a little bit bigger as if to imply that maybe there are touch interface Macs down the road or at least in apple's thoughts um which would make some of those user interface elements touch targets yeah I don't know that I buy that. And and here's here's why. So or I, I'm going to get real deep in the weeds here for a second. So I apologize to anybody who doesn't care. But um, All right. So last year with Mac OS Catalina, Apple introduces Mac Catalyst, which for those of you who don't know, is a way for developers to more easily get their iPad apps to run on the Mac. And they've also introduced a new programming language, sort of a way to design user interfaces called Swift UI. And that is compatible from everything from Apple Watch up to the Mac. You know, so really small up to really big. And it, and then they, this year, updated and made Catalyst a lot more powerful. And they themselves used Catalyst to handle maps and messages in macOS Big Sur. So they're using this themselves. This is not just a, like, this is good for developers. This is a, Apple is using this as well. And then, and I'm just going to get into the trip chip transition as well. So Apple is now, instead of uh, Macs running on Intel processors, which they have since 2000. The first, they announced the transition to Intel in 2005. The first one shipped in 2006. Um, they Apple is making their own chips, which are like the ones that they have made in the iPhone and iPad. And we are now going to be able to run iPhone apps on these Apple Silicon-based Macs. I don't know. I don't believe that they are really trying to bring the iPad and Mac into one device. What I think they're trying to do is say we want it to be as easy as possible for you to develop an app and have it be on apple watch on iphone on ipad on apple tv and on mac and make that as easy as possible for you so that our users both yours as a developer and ours as apple customers are can can have the software that they want and it's a good experience. And so if we have similar, you know, iPad like design on the Mac, that's less work that you have to do to get it running on the Mac because it looks the same. If the icons are the same shape, then that's less design work you have to do to make your icon look good on the Mac. And I think this is great because there are times that there are apps that I want to use for my iPad that are not on the Mac. Shortcuts is a big one. And I'm kind of sad that they didn't do a catalyst based shortcuts, but I I don't know that it's like, we are going to have touchscreen Macs. It's, and Oh, the other thing is they have made it where, um, if you, you can pay once and have your app and, and have the app on all those platforms. So I can buy, um, good notes, for example, and one one time, and it is on my phone, my iPad, and my Mac with that one purchase. And so, as, as a user and and a developer, if I want to use it on my Mac, I, I don't use it on my Mac very much because it's more handwriting based. But I can access my notes there, and that's a great experience for me. But then when I want to handwrite on my iPad with the pencil, I can do that. And that's a great experience based on that device. And so, they're bringing what they can together while still keeping things unique. That is my thought, not that there will be touch-based Macs. I agree with all of that and still think it's possible that there will one day be touch Macs. I don't know that they'll be the same device as iPads. I mean, this is a real tricky thing to figure out because the the Mac, as even I have learned myself, and I'm not doing 
anything really totally serious on my Mac, like accessing the terminal on a regular basis. Um, I'm just, you know, doing things like editing video and audio and, um, you know, using Chrome extensions, you know, but still stuff that, that the flexibility of the Mac is really good for. Um, and like we were saying earlier, like, the, you know, the iPad has all these different input methods and the Apple Pencil and the touch, you know, drawing directly on it with touch is something that distinguishes it. Like, I don't know. I, it's, it's, it's just interesting to see what they would make. I don't think they're going to like merge the two because I think we need that flexibility of the Mac. And I think we need that model of the iPad as being this sort of flexible, thin sheet of paper like glass that can be adapted to different kinds of input methods. But I don't know. I, it seems like, you know, at maybe, maybe they could, I don't know. I don't know. I, for me, I don't know what, how they would do it in a way that it would be compelling to me. Like I ideally, as these two devices do borrow more and more and more from each other, I do run into more points of friction where it's like, okay, I, I almost am forgetting which device I'm in front of. It's like, is this the one that can let me draw on the screen? <laughs> or, or is this the one that, you know, it's like when you're on an iPad and you're in mail and you're using a cursor and a keyboard to do, you know, accurate, typing and selecting of interface elements on the screen like it's just it's just really easy to forget which device you're on and um you know it's like okay well i want to edit my movie now well well, my macbook's in the other room and again these are micro inconveniences but still it's like what would they do that would meaningfully make one hardware product out of both of them i don't know i think it's more likely that the mac would just get a test screen but then why like (laughs) are you gonna reach up and touch it from the keyboard or would it bend over on its back and accept pencil input? I mean, this this is why I think what you were saying is so interesting because like if you're an iOS developer, they pretty much said that you have to opt out of having your app appear on the Mac App Store. So it's like you think, okay, if Apple is gonna start making their Macs with new chips, which by the way, if you don't know anything about an ARM chip or Apple Silicon, all you need to know, it's like better, faster, stronger, but you know, (laughs) Apple can, can control a chip that they design and do lots of cool stuff with it that they cannot do with Intel's chips. So they're going to make their computers probably more battery efficient, more powerful. You know, they're going to do all sorts of really great stuff with the hardware and software that some of which maybe we haven't even thought about or seen yet. But just looking to your point about the app store, I'm thinking like, okay, if You can now run an iOS app on the Mac without the developer even needing to do any design work at all. Well, what if that's an app like you just mentioned GoodNotes? What if there's a developer who makes a handwriting app for the iPad, which is now just magically imported over to the Mac? Well, you can't draw on it. Well, what if there's a touchscreen Mac? Maybe that further bridges that software gap where the App Store ecosystems are able to take advantage of more and more of the same technologies is one another i don't know i'm just i'm just sort of like thinking into the thin air here i mean the bottom line is ios apps on the mac has tons of weird implications that i'm totally curious to figure out yeah yeah i i don't i'm either way i am super excited about it i i have to hijack this opportunity to which i always do to say that there are some music education apps I should say there are some music and some education apps that I would love to have on the Mac that are iOS only currently. Um, I'm sure you can think of a couple too in your own life. I mean, even uh, aside from productivity, like Overcast, there's not a Mac app for that. But just having it on my Mac and being able to play a podcast while I, I get some work done, huge. And yeah, so the implication is that these new Macs that have Apple's chip would just you know these apps that don't have mac counterparts would just appear on the mac app store without the developer doing any work so in that case let's say that the developer of overcast marco arment doesn't do anything with his app we would just have like a little floating iphone window on our mac screen which to for me would be perfectly fine that's all i need to do is just i just need a play button to start my podcast that's all i need um but i think the implication at least from apple to developers is then but yeah, you really want to do the catalyst work and make it nice Um, because otherwise we're going to put your junky iPhone app (laughs) on our Mac and it's not going to work very well. It's just going to be there. 
which I get where Apple is coming from with that, but it also seems like it could lead to some weirdness. Like there are going to be apps that some, there are going to be some developers of some education and some music software specifically that I, that I can think of that are going to just not really think that through and their apps are going to end up on the Mac and they're going to like be broken or have no purpose. Like does Apple really want dead apps? You know, like I'm talking about apps like things that all they do is you open the app and it's just a, a launch screen that tells you, you know, hey, this app is actually an extension or like a messages sticker pack. Uh, it doesn't really do anything unless you're in the messages app or unless you're in the photos app. You, you know, can run this to you know, cut a bird out of the sky of your nice, pretty photograph or something like that. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't think Apple wants just all that random cruft. I don't know. It's tough. Uh, the, the music, the music specific example that's coming to my mind that has the most weird implications is um, software plugins. So like you can be, um, you can make an app that is like a reverb or an equalizer where when you're in GarageBand, you can side uh, side load is not the technically correct term but you can side load a reverb plugin so that like if you've recorded your voice into the ipad version of GarageBand, that reverb will apply to that track what's going to happen if that reverb plugin is just all of a sudden on the mac like is it going to work in the mac version of GarageBand and logic i don't know i mean it's it's just interesting what what that could do you know if we just have like all these apps that don't, you know, that are broken or don't do anything. I don't know. It just doesn't seem like the kind of world that Apple wants to create for the Mac. But, but I do think I, I saw, I've, I've tried to watch some of the more developer focused talks over the last couple of days when I've had a couple minutes. And I do believe that like, if you have a photo extension, so if, if there's an app that I have on my iPhone that can edit photos a lot of times if I'm in the photos app looking at the picture and I tap the share sheet, there's like an edit in darkroom or edit in, you know, a uh, pixel mater photo or something. And that is there. And you can just kind of do some inline editing while never leaving the photo app, but using the tools from this third party app. And I believe those photos extensions still w- still work in the photos app on Mac, even if it's just the iOS version, I think I saw that somewhere. So I'm wondering if some of those plugins would do the same. And I, and I spoke to a couple of friends actually today that I was really curious about who work, um, with some very advanced digital audio workstation software and some score editing software, you know, things where using software plugins is very commonplace on the Mac. And I, those conversations have led me to believe that some of the underlying technologies for software plugins on iOS are similar to some of the underlying technologies for software plugins on the Mac. So it is entirely possible that, you know, your your reverb that you use on the iPad would actually be able to be used as a reverb for a Mac, you know, logic project, which which I think is really cool. I mean, the thing the thing that I really want, there's just really two, there are two music apps that we've, we've talked about them before, Craig. I just really want the Tonal Energy Tuner app and the Fourscore Reader app to be on my Mac. I just, I need them there. Like I use Tonal Energy in the band classroom all the time. It's a, it's a, um, <laughs> it's a polyphonic tuning app that can simultaneously run advanced metronome sequences and can handle multiple tuning systems so it'll go into just intonation it'll go into equal temperament and i use it all the time but it would be so great to run it on the mac which is the device that i more frequently have plugged into our sound system because the sound system is located in the same place where you plug it in the computer to the projector so it's you know it's kind of a command station and to be able to manipulate it with keyboard shortcuts that are really tactile and easy to feel rather than like holding my tiny little phone, which is, you know, I'm tall, but I keep my music stand really low. So I'm like fiddling with my phone. It's just not, it's just not good. Um, and then the four score app is where I keep all of my sheet music. You know, I have to keep a duplicate copy of all my sheet music in iCloud so that when I'm on the Mac and I need to reference one of them, I just I search for that copy, but man, it would be a lot easier if my music library existed only in one place. And that place was four score. Oh, I bet. Yeah. Are there other education apps that if you were still in the classroom, you would love to have them on the Mac? 
Oh. You know, that's interesting because I ran my whole classroom from an iPad. Um, I mean, even just some things like instead of having to go into a browser and, and a parent communication tool like Remind or um, even when I was working with even younger kids like Seesaw or something, it'd be nice just to have a quick a quick access to that instead of um, having to go through a browser. And um, yeah. That that would be nice. Yeah, there's there's stuff like our LMS in Howard County Public Schools is Canvas, and Canvas on the web is infinitely more uh, powerful and in in some respects easier to use than its iOS app counterpart. Uh, like for example, the iOS app, the iOS app won't even show you a grid of grades. Like you can enter grades from the assignment page, but it's like multiple tap layers deep to input one grade for one assignment to one student. Whereas the web app has like this Excel style grid. That's, you know, you just tab through it. And, um, you know, so I, I use the website even when I'm in, uh, you know, on my iPad using a cursor and mouse, but, um, the canvas app is just kind of a nice way to do some basics. Like, messaging all of my students like the interface for it is a lot more reliable and dependable the buttons don't do weird stuff like when i'm on the messaging screen of canvas on safari like (laughs) who even knows where the buttons are going to appear like the layout is wonky every time i open it and if i try to resize my window things start shifting around in weird places sometimes they go like i can't even see certain buttons that i need like just having the ios version on my mac if not for the purpose of quickly adding assignments and messaging parents. I don't know. I think, I think that would be super cool. Another example is Synergy, which is uh, it manages student contact data. And Synergy is, again, it's infinitely more powerful on the website, but uh, you can't even bookmark the website in Safari. Like, it's this weird, this weird bug. Like, if you bookmark Synergy... Like it gives you this dead end, an error. So you have to like, I have to have a tab permanently open that takes me to our county staff hub where there's a button to get to Synergy. Like I have to like set up a, a, like a breadcrumb trail for myself of places to click to get to Synergy <laughs> every time. Whereas the iPad app doesn't do half the stuff, but it keeps me logged in. <laughs> so if I just want an email parent, I'd love to have the iPad app on my Mac. Yeah. Yeah. That. I'm really excited about what the future could hold for, and you know, and it's going to take a while. The first Max with, as they're calling it, Apple Silicon. I can't, I've heard that phrase a lot. Um, they're not going to ship until later this year, and the complete line won't transition for two years. So, and then, you know, people are still going to have Intel Max that are running. You know, I don't know when I will own my first ARM Mac. Um, or Apple Silicon Mac. Uh, so it's going to be a while before we get to this point, but I'm so excited about Mac OS in a way that I haven't been in years. Yeah, me too. It's going to be interesting. It'll probably be a while before I buy one, but the future is, is uh, super exciting. Yeah. So do you want to talk about app and album of the week? Let's do it. I'm even more prepared this time than I was last time. So That's great. Awesome. Um... I usually go first. Do you want to go first? Uh, no, you go for it. Okay, sure. So, um, I don't, I don't want to break week, tradition. No, I mean, like, you know, <laughs> I've only been doing album and app of the week for, this is episode 11. So, you know, oh, I wanted to say this too. I, I keep forgetting if I say this on the episodes, I was going to make it a more significant like segment of the show. But then I realized it would be really dumb if I did that. But I at least want to explain if you're ever wondering why the, the music changes at the beginning of each episode. I'm going through a phase right now where it's a creative fun thing to do for me to like improvise a short 20 second piece of background music for each episode. And it's just like a fun creative outlet for me. And it keeps me learning things that are new. Um, I even give each week's jingle a name. Um, They're getting less clever as I go. But like, for example, like in episode two, when Ethan Hine came on, we talked at length about the racial politics of hip hop 
in public school education. And we talked about the song um, Old Town Road at length, and I mistakenly called it Old Country Road. The um, Who sings that song? Um, Lil- John Denver. Oh, <laughs> I thought you were asking yeah. about Old Town Road. <laughs> yes, Country Road yeah. is John Denver. So, you know, I was like, I was like, all right, so it would be fun to like, that if the music for this episode was like kind of like a Southern country rock feel with a trap beat under it. And I was like, you know what? Um, I should play some guitar. So I broke out my electric guitar and I broke out some software plugins. And I was like, you know, what kind of guitar amp would sound like that? And I texted some guitar friends. I should have texted you. Yes, please. And, uh, and I was like playing around. So, you know, it was fun. I, it's a learning process. I learn things. I'm creative. I'm, thinking that I'm eventually going to settle on some consistent music, but I just thought I would address that because uh, I was, when I d- made that decision to do that, I was thinking that I would like talk about the jingle and I was like, there's no like social <laughs> or emotional significance to a 20 second improvisation I did in logic pro. So I will request I will not- that whenever I'm on though, we use the, the old class nerd jingle. You don't have to, it's your show, but every time I hear it still, it just makes me smile. And we did that last time I was on. But if you need to do something different, I'm okay with it. No, actually, I was looking forward to it providing a break from me needing to <laughs> record something new. Nice. So. Okay. And it's good. It's a good song. It is. All right. Great. App of the week. Yes. App of the week. Um, so, um, yeah, so I've been using uh, an app called Toggle. And... Uh, this is a time tracking application. So, you know, the nature of working from home has meant that I am doing some projects for school that are a lot more time consuming. Like I'm not spending my time in the same way at all. Um, the kinds of things I do during the normal school day are really, really difficult to track because it's lots of little tiny things. Um, whereas lately, as I've mentioned a few times, I've been taking these video performances of my students doing concert band pieces and then like um, stitching them all together into a big final cut project. Well, this takes some time and uh, I've been really curious, you know, how long does one of these projects take me? Not to mention, um, I've been taking on some other creative projects. Like I've been doing more frequent episodes of the show and I've just been generally very curious how long certain projects and transitions take me to complete and how erratically I start and stop them. So Toggle is an app that simply, you know, you tell it what are some projects you're working on and then you set, you start running a timer whenever you're working on that thing. Um, these kinds of apps have never stuck for me because there's lots of ways you can get them wrong. Like you can forget to start the timer, you can forget to stop the timer and Toggle solves a lot of those frictions. Um, it is a web tool, so it is running in the cloud. So like, it doesn't matter what device I'm staring at. If I've started a timer on my phone, uh, then I go on my iPad, that timer is still running. Um, if you're idle for a while, it asks, do you want me to actually not count any of that time? And if you're really active moving your keyboard and mouse for a few minutes straight, it'll send you a notification asking if you would like to start tracking time. You can have varying different projects. You can describe the type of activity you're doing. So like for me, I would say, okay, I'm working on this video project and I am prepping or I'm editing or I'm sharing with the staff. Uh, and then you can do some tags and some other minor things. So it's it's been really helpful. I'm getting um, an accurate read. You know, the thing that struck me within two days was how erratically I would switch between different projects. And, um, you know, when you see, cause what I did was I went on a website called Zapier, which can automate different web services. And I created a, to, uh, a little automation that anytime I track in toggle goes to a Google calendar that I can turn check on and off in my calendar. So I can like actually see where my time is alongside my calendar events. And when I have like five minutes of video editing, followed by five minutes of answering email, followed by 20 minutes of cooking, like it just, it, it really is helping me to get my act together and get a lot more focused. Yeah. Uh, I have done this in the past. Have you on iOS tried Timery out? Yeah. So that was going to be, I was going to do them as a pair. So Timery is 
a client for Toggle because Toggle is a website with lots of APIs that other apps can link into. Um, there's an app called Timery for the iPad and iPhone, which is, it's just an alternative to the Toggle app. And I actually have been using it because speaking of widgets, it has a widget that you can have permanently fixed to the screen of your iPad or your iPhone, which can start the different timers and tell you which one is currently running. Yeah, it's just a, a better iOS interface than Toggle's own app, a hundred percent. It's really nice, and it's got great shortcut support. Yes. So right now, I have a um, a shortcut called "I'm podcasting," and there's a really noisy. We have to get the the radon thing fixed in the in my studio. It's like rattly for some reason. Um, so I have to like turn it off temporarily when I record. So. I run a shortcut and it says, okay, don't forget to turn off the thing. And then it sets a reminder two hours from that point to turn it back on. And then it starts a timer called recording under a project called Music Ed Tech Talk. And then it puts my phone in Do Not Disturb. And I'm proud of it. That's awesome. You should like get it to set some mood lighting as well. Oh, yeah, that's nice. Yeah, it's very bright in here. Why is it so bright? I'm recording. Yeah, there you go. You could even have like a, a hue a hue bulb in the hall. I don't know the layout of your house at all, but like that turns red when you're recording. So Mary knows. Or... I, I did think about that. Yeah, no, that's a great <laughs> idea. <laughs> uh, all right. So my app of the week is called Meter, M-E-E-T-E-R. Um, and it is... An app I use it on the Mac. I believe it's available on iOS, but it runs in the menu bar. And if it looks at your calendar and any Zoom meetings that you have coming up, or Google Hangout, any you know uh, web conferencing meeting you have coming up, it just automatically puts the link to that in your menu bar, and it can alert you like five minutes before the meeting and say, "Do you want to join the meeting?" And you just tap the button, and it connects you. Um. And like I said, I spend all day, every day on Zoom and not having to go into my calendar and find the event and then find the Zoom link for that particular event. It's just there in my menu bar is super nice. It's a free app. Uh, Literally today, they pushed an update that had a $4 in-app purchase that unlocked a few extra features. And I have used it so much that I wanted to give the developer $4. And so I just bought that immediately. But I think the way that I have, everything I have been doing before today is still free. So um, if you find yourself constantly having to remember what link to use for virtual meetings nowadays uh this could save you some time and frustration that's awesome did you know that fantastical now has join it like detects meetings in your calendar events yeah i did see that too i still am not on fantastical 3 just because 40 dollars a year for a calendar is just it's too much for me i I can't if it were like 20 25 dollars i might do it but 40 just it's really a lot for a calendar app. Yep. I do not disagree with that. Uh, I'm trying it for the year. It's it's a tool I use a lot. So yeah. uh, I'm trying it. And yeah, we'll see if it sticks for next year. But yeah, no, that's, that's like really awesome. And so and topical. I know. Very topical. Yeah, I try. Yeah. I tried that last time I did dark noise, you know, working at home, having a, a white noise app. Now, now it's a uh, virtual meetings. I got you covered. Yeah, really. Wow. Okay. And you always, you are consistently mentioning things I have not heard of, which is, no, that's why, that's why we keep you around. Oh, that's nice. (laughs) Um, album of the week is next. Um, I am going to continue. I have been mentioning so many albums in the, like the contemporary, or I guess, I guess new grass is the word that some people use. Like, you know, just really progressive bluegrass artists. Um, there's just they, there have been a lot of albums in this space that have come out over the past couple of months, and um, something that a lot of musicians who are in the know have been waiting for is the sequel to the Goat Rodeo Sessions. Uh, you're gonna like this. Have you heard? Are you familiar with the Goat Rodeo Sessions? I'm not, but I'm looking it up as you speak. Yeah. 
Yeah, so it's it's like a bluegrass classical super group. Uh, it features Yo-Yo Ma, Stuart Duncan, Edgar Meyer, and Chris Thiele. And they are all uh, associated with, um, you know, Yo-Yo Ma is associated a lot with classical music, but he, he really he really plays everything. He's really been such a diverse musician over his career. And, um, you know, Edgar Meyer is similar. Like, he's dipping his toes in so many different things that it's really hard to pin him down. Christy Lee and uh, Stuart Duncan come from, I believe, like, you know, stronger bluegrass backgrounds, but have, uh, you know, have very much distinguished their tonal concepts and their playing styles around similar kinds of discipline that I think is associated with classical music. Uh, They're influenced by classical music. They play classical music. I'm using classical music in that really broad way that's meaningless, of course, which just encompasses like the years like 1600 through like the early 20th century. But um, you know what I mean? Like you've just got these four musicians who came together and have put together these kind of like through composed, uh, how do you even describe the sound? I mean, it's sort of, it's a very Appalachian sound, but it's also got a lot of the things that people like about progressive music, like mixed meter and interesting harmonic progressions. Um, it's also got a lot of the things that people like about listening to, you know, musicians from a symphonic background like Yo-Yo Ma. It's just got like very pristine and clean tone quality. It's just a hybrid of, of different traditions and backgrounds from these four musicians. And it's full of great collaborations like Aoife O'Donovan, who's a wonderful singer. She's on some tracks and um, it's just, you know, it's just a really, really great album. I don't know. It's funny. It's like some people really don't like bluegrass and some people really don't like the kinds of adventurous things that this progressive brand of bluegrass does, but I don't know anyone who does not like the goat rodeo sessions. It's very listenable, very approachable. So what I'm searching goat rodeo sessions in Apple music and all I'm finding is from 2012. Do you say there's something new that I should be listening to? Or is this, this is the 2012 is what I need to, to look. So you should definitely listen to that one because it's excellent. Um, but they just released a second album um, it's called Not Our First Goat Rodeo. <laughs> awesome. Wait, hold on. Or is that the name? Hold yes, on. that is. Is that the name? Actually, I, that is. Oh, <laughs> yeah. It's that. That is the artist in Apple Music somehow. So anyway, I'm adding that. Done. Wait, Goat Rodeo Sessions is the artist? No, it's, so there's Goat Rodeo Sessions is, it looks like, no, no, it's, sorry. They're listed separately. So Yo-Yo Ma, Stuart Duncan. Edgar Meyer and Chris Teeley, and then the two albums. So it, they're yes, those those four are the artist, and then Goat Rodeo Sessions is the first album, not our first Goat Rodeo second album. You'll link to it in the show notes. I sure will. Yeah. All right. So I'm kind of cheating a little bit because I want to recommend a TV show and some music at the same time, and there's a way to do this. Um, have you seen any or heard anything about the show Central Park on Apple TV Plus? <laughs> yeah, I've watched the first five minutes of the first episode. I am so in love with this television show. For those of you who don't know, it's it's on Apple TV Plus, which if you have bought an Apple device uh, since Apple TV Plus launched in September, you get a free year of Apple TV Plus. So... Yeah, a lot of us have it for free. If not, it's five dollars a month. And even if you don't keep it going like you would Netflix or Disney Plus, watch this show. Um, it's from the creators of Bob's Burgers, but also created by Josh Gad. And it's very Bob's Burgers E, but it is a musical. And so every episode has amazingly catchy songs. Some of them like Sarah Bareilles wrote some songs for it. Great music. But then the actors are Leslie Odom Jr. and David Diggs from Hamilton, uh, Kristen Bell, uh, Titus Burgess from The Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, uh, uh, and uh, a bu- there are a bunch of Hamilton folks. Chris Jackson has a cameo. 
He played George Washington, the original cast. Uh, you know, Fred Armisen has a cameo. And there are these and Leslie Odom Jr., I would argue, is the the main character. He he was Aaron Burr in Hamilton. And like it's him doing Aaron Burr, but is this nerdy park manager and he's like having rap battles and singing a lot of similar things to what he did in Hamilton, but about meaningless stuff like graffiti in a park and people stomping on his flowers. And it is so catchy. The music is so good and the show is so funny. And I just, it brings me so much joy in the middle of a stressful time right now. And my wife and I, we did, I would say it's like, Rated PG-13 ish would be my kind of thing. So we're not listening to it around our kids, but like when they're not, we both cannot stop singing these songs and listening to it. It is excellent. I'm glad to hear that it is as good as you're saying it is. The main thing for me is like, is it funny? Cause I'm the, the opening song is, is ultra catchy. So I, I have no doubt that the music is top notch. And actually Mary is interested in watching it, but we are just, so much right now just bouncing between lots of different media like we need to get we need to get a plan yeah it it is funny uh genuinely funny if it, it is my kind of humor i i will say you know i i'm trying to uh, other comedy shows that i have adored uh anything tina fey's involved in so 30 rock is probably my all-time favorite show um I right now I love what we do in the shadows. That kind of quirky. Weird, oh, so oh, good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's my kind of comedy. Um, Parks and Rec, The Office, you know those kind of shows. So, I, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. Anything like that is like gold for me. If that's not your deal, then you know it might not be for you. But um, the musical component of it too, uh, so good. All right. You're making me a believer. I'm going to push that to the top of the list, I think, after uh, after Avatar. The season is not over yet. The new episodes come out on Friday. So if, you know, I don't know how long Avatar will take you or how many episodes are going to be in the season. I think we're like five or six episodes in. And I don't know if it's eight, 10, 12. But, um, you know, so you've got if you'd rather wait till you can binge them all, you've got some time. Perfect. I like that plan. Awesome. All right. Solid picks. I've been, I've been really like last time I felt like my picks were good last time, but it was a, Oh, I got to come up with this. Like right now, this was like, Ooh, what? It, like I've been dwelling on this for days. Good. I'm well, I'm glad. I'm glad you take album and app of the week. So seriously, way more seriously than anything else we do. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I think I could probably spit out an album and an app of the week on the fly. I just like, uh, software is, you know, music is something that I understand more than I understand technology, but technology is just easier to talk about. It's just, you know, it's like, here's what the thing does. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I could easily make that part of it up every time, but it's like to speak meaningfully. Well, and I, and I probably should think, you know, a little bit harder about how I talk about some of my musical selections. Cause I usually do just kind of, I'm listening to it and I'm like, Oh, this is going to be album of the week, or album of the week. And then it's like, Oh, well, I didn't really think through. That's why I sound like garbage when I was explaining goat rodeo sessions <laughs> a few minutes ago. <laughs> uh, oh man. Well, thanks for having me on again. Yeah. You're it's been great. Um, you probably won't be on again in two episodes, but you'll be on again soon. And, uh, until then, where should people find out more about you? You've got some places that you're writing on the internet. You know, I, I've been keeping to myself a little bit more and trying to write more just in day one. So you can't really find me there. But, uh, you know, check Twitter. Uh, I'm at Craig McClellan there. And anything that I do post on the internet is generally there. So I am on Twitter as well, at Robbie Burns. You can find out about this show and find all episodes at musicedtechtalk.com. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Overcast, all of the all of the apps. You can subscribe to it. Um, you can check out more of my writing about similar subjects on my blog, robbieburns.com slash blog. I'm on all of the other social media places as well, but Twitter is the main one. So there you go. Well, thanks again, Craig. Um, this has been fun. I don't know what to do now that we don't have a this is how we end the episode phrase, but thank you for having me. <laughs>